This morning's sermon is not the sermon I originally prepared, but it has sprung out of events this week in the Church of England. So if you're sitting comfortably, or even if you're not, let us begin. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 says, There is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. I wonder if you saw the headlines from the Church of England and it is putting aside a hundred million pounds to address past wrongs around slavery. Some people have reacted quite negatively to this and I would like to explore this morning why I think this action was not only necessary but is also only a beginning. What do you look at me and what do you see? Well, besides my stunningly good looks and amazing physique, I am white, male, middle class, educated, straight, middle-aged, non-disabled, senior clergy, the list goes on. And what is striking about all of these is that they are areas of privilege. What do I mean by that? Well, the dictionary defines privilege as a right, immunity, or benefit enjoyed by a particular person or group of people beyond the advantages of many. In my case, this means that being a man has given me advantages in the way that society or others treat me. My mom couldn't stay on in school after 15 because she was a woman. My mother-in-law had to give up nursing when she married. But these are not just examples in the past. Pay differentials, career opportunities, just being safe from gender-based violence. There are numerous examples of where sexism is alive and doing very well today. I could go through all my list and show how I have had advantages because I am middle class, educated, straight, non-disabled and so on. I need to recognise that I have this advantage and that others do not. It is part of the sin of the world and if we're working for true justice, then I need to be working against it. Which brings us to the particular headline of this week. What is some of the background? Well, essentially the Church of England has done an exercise where it has worked out that some of its assets have come directly from the practice of slavery, and very specifically, the Atlantic slave trade. You may be wondering why I'm being precise about what I'm referring to. Surely slavery has always existed and still exists. Sadly, both are true and the sin of slavery is still very much alive today. What was significantly different about the Atlantic slave trade was that it was aimed at one particular group of people. In the past and today, anyone can be caught up in slavery. They were often the product of war and the losing side was taken into slavery. It wasn't that they were seen as anything less, they found themselves simply on the losing side. It was and is still wrong, but there was an important difference with the Atlantic slave trade. Here, a group of people were identified as being less than fully human, therefore could be not only sold, but sought out for slavery. They did not deserve anything better. This was compounded by being justified from random passages or verses in the Bible. So if slave traders went raiding and found a black person, a white person, a South Asian person, and an East Asian person, then only the black person would be taken into slavery. It was not about winning or losing, it was that they were seen as less. Out of this, many individuals and countries made a lot of money. 
Liverpool recognises that much of its old wealth was made in this trade. And so it has the International Slavery Museum, which explores this truth. The Church of England has also examined its past, not before time, and is likewise trying to acknowledge and repent in a public way. The word that is sometimes used in these circumstances is reparations. The dictionary defines reparations as the action of making amends for a wrong one has done by providing payment or other assistance to those who have been wronged. Often this can be seen as punishment, a bit like a fine, and this has been picked up by certain people this week. However, if we listen to the definition again, that is not its purpose. The definition is the action of making amends for a wrong one has done by providing payment or other assistance to those who have been wronged. The word reparation comes from the Latin to restore. The word repair also comes from the same root. And I would like to suggest that reparation is less about punishment and much more about repairing. You might say, but this Atlantic slavery was hundreds of years ago and it's now stopped. What is there to repair? Sadly, the effects of the attitudes and philosophy that led to it are very much still around today in what we call racism. And that, sadly, is still very much present in the Church of England. A recent report entitled From Lament into Action came out in 2021. And I can highly recommend the book ghost ship where the author tells of his and others experience firsthand of the racism within our modern church. These are not examples from the dim past and from slavery though sadly the attitudes and behaviors often find their roots there. No these are now in this generation the author says, we as a church are handing out stones and calling it bread. What is the opposite of racist? It is not not racist. Non-racism is a non-thing, a nothing. Too often we have used this to turn away from what we should be doing. I am not racist is simply sitting on the fence, and this is not a fence to sit on. The language that is used is much more about being anti-racist. Basically, if we are not part of the solution, then we are part of the problem. Simply by being white and not recognizing how this makes me privileged is denying that there is a problem. I'm upholding the status quo, which is racist. Of course I've been discriminated against in my life, but I cannot use that as a shield to hide or ignore how I am still privileged and how that privilege affects others. I am the epitome of privilege, white, male, educated, middle-aged, senior clergy, the list goes on. I wonder what are your areas of privilege and how does this affect you and those around you? And it's not just in this area that we need to be more self-aware. This week it was announced that someone who did not ordain women or receive communion from a woman would be made a diocesan bishop. I have to say that I find this very worrying and wonder if in future years we will need to repent of the five guiding principles that surround this and other similar appointments. In my role as Diocesan Director of Ordinance, I saw how these at times were more like punishment on women than principles of love and grace. 
Also, another bishop publicly supported and affirmed the rights of people from the LGBT community within the Church of England. It is likely that this week we will find out what the House of Bishops is proposing as a way forward. Whatever that looks like, I hope it truly recognises the pain and suffering we as a church have inflicted on people from the LGBT community. With people from the UK minority ethnic community, with women, with people from the LGBT community, with those from the disabled community and so on, these are day-to-day -day lived experiences of pain that show the Church of England needs repairing. Is there a problem with our finances? Of course there is. But if we address that without addressing these other deep-rooted wrongnesses, then we will not be a church, but simply an institution. You may well disagree with some of what I have spoken about. I don't say that I have all the truth, but I do hope that this morning I've given you something to reflect on and encouraged you to look beyond the headlines of this last week. And do pray for our senior church leaders as they wrestle with these complex areas that do need urgent repair. Amen.